Last week, Ford officially announced a discontinuation of the Fiesta nameplate, and with it, seemingly their entire presence in the small car market. Now, in reality, the continuation's merely semantic, as there have been seven generations of Fiesta. But as there seems to be no new small Ford incoming, let's take a walk back in history to Ford's glory era in the UK with this full-range brochure from October 1982. Through the 60s and 70s, Ford in the UK underwent two drastic changes. First, it merged with its German counterpart to create Ford of Europe, and second, it became, by far, Britain's most successful car manufacturer. For every year, from 1968 to 2020, Ford was the leader of the market, and though they went under sustained and renewing threats through that 52-year spell, they just kept plodding along at the top. So to identify a single era as the highlight is very difficult, but as British Leyland fell and Vauxhall grew, this early 80s spell is probably the zenith. So our first sight is of the Sierra. 1982 was the year the Sierra came along to replace the Cortina as Ford's family car, so it's obvious that it would be placed on the cover at the centre of our attention, complete with aerodynamic wheel trims and in a modern silver shade, emphasising the move towards the jelly mould. We'll come back to the Sierra later, but before we get into it, I want to address one more thing, and that's Ford's marketing genius. It's very plausible that Ford only retained that top spot for so long because of their marketing. And in this era, they were using my favourite Ford tagline. Ford gives you more. And as we turn the cover, we see what's possibly the biggest hit of that brilliant marketing, with a cutaway of the famous Cosworth DFV, a power unit that remains the most successful ever to be raced in Formula One. And 1982 was probably the best time to be running an advert like this, as the three litre V8 had hit its peak. The double four valve powered the world champion every year from 1968 to 82, with the exception of Ferrari wins in 75, 77 and 79. This was the power unit that pushed Graham Hill, Jackie Stewart, Jochen Rint, Emerson Fittipaldi, James Hunt, Mario Andretti, Alan Jones, Nelson Piquet and Keke Rosberg to glory. In reality, of course, the engineering has nothing to do with Ford, but it was backed by Ford and badged as a Ford. So all it takes is one line. Our cars have racing in their blood. So to the cars themselves, and first up is our little friend, the original Ford Fiesta. When the Fiesta was launched in 1976, it was arguably Ford's first proper modern car, with a transversely mounted front engine driving the front wheels, taking after the Austin Mini and Fiat 127, and joining cars like the Renault 5 and Volkswagen Polo in a new class of small cars. Now, this brochure is properly comprehensive, to the point where, despite this being full range, there's actually little point in producing individual brochures for each car, save for saving paper and ink. And rather than having a load of photos, marketing rubbish, then a single big rundown of the trim levels at the back of each section, we have each page dedicated to a trim level, starting at the bottom with the Pop and Pop Plus. There's something I find ridiculously charming about basic small cars. They're just perfectly simple, utilitarian and have no pretensions. And this diamond white popular is just that, right down to the colour and the vinyl seats. But I'd just like to bring our attention down to the spec, because these basic Fiestas only have a single sun visor, a manual windscreen washer pump, and what isn't noted is that they didn't have a temperature sensor for the radiator fan, so the fan was always running as long as the ignition was on. Properly basic. But what we also see is that because it's 1982, there are three ashtrays. Marvellous. The Fiesta L brings up another equipment-related topic, and that's more of how Ford so easily managed to attract buyers. 
Now, the Fiesta only started to outsell the Mini in 1979, which is very surprising. And for a couple of years later on, it was outsold by the Metro. But overall, these were more popular than the Leyland stuff I love so much. And I think that's mainly down to the equipment Ford are offering. Even the most basic metros had a heated rear screen, twin sun visors, a thermostatically controlled radiator fan, and an electric washer pump. But those features aren't flashy. They're just basic ease of use things. Instead, Ford decided to give the Popular Plus a clock and the L intermittent wipe, something only high-end metros had, and even then, only from 1984. Those are things any passenger or any punter in a showroom can see and will care about, because they make the car feel more luxurious. Additionally, you can spec a range of engines on each trim level, with anything from the little 950 Kent to the 55 horsepower 1100. We're getting towards the posh ones now with the Fiesta GL, and over the page the Fiesta S with its sporty-ish image. Now, both these cars are available with the 66 brake horsepower 1300 engine, and it's here I think we should talk about the engineering. Because with this being Ford's first modern foray into front-wheel drive, they could have done anything, really, with the suspension. But the recipe they chose was entirely predictable, because the front end was just what they'd been doing for decades, fitting a set of McPherson struts. But that was very similar to what Fiat and Volkswagen had started doing, and though this sounds universal and boring in 2022, many manufacturers, including Renault, were using things like torsion bars, and BL were being weird with their rubber cones and hydrogas. At the back, a set of trailing arms and coil springs with a panard rod locating the solid axle. And as a whole recipe, that was very simple. The Fiesta wasn't the most comfortable or best handling small car of its era, but it was still very good, and more importantly, simple and understandable. Before we move on though, look at how they made the GL and the S suit their respective markets. For the GL, bumper overriders, crushed velour and some fake wood. For the S, Carla trim, probably one of the coolest fitted to any car in the 80s. A tachometer, stiffer suspension to be fair, and some red detailing in the instruments. That's all there is to it. But those very minor alterations comprehensively change the image these two cars have. And again, that's how Fords were everything to everyone. The top luxury model was the Fiesta Gear, and all of that GL luxury is carried over, but we have alloy wheels, a cassette deck, a sunroof, a digital clock, and opening quarter lights. And they did all this without adding trim that was too distastefully old-fashioned. It does have randomly added wood finishes, but the other trimmings are tasteful, so the colours are right. There are no over-the-top wood cappings on the doors or leather seats. It's just straddling that line of luxury that appeals to everyone. And finally for the Fiesta is the famous XR2. Now this car was only introduced in 1981, following on from the short-lived Fiesta Supersport. And since the car's initial launch, Ford had offered a variety of option packs that could add some genuine sporting intention to the Fiesta. But now was a mainstream, genuinely quick factory Fiesta. As with every Mark I, the XR2's engine was a modified version of Ford's faithful old Kent engine. But while the lesser models used the newly christened Valencia variant, the XR2, for complicated reasons, used the original Crossflow Kent. Why isn't important, but how is. Because at 1600cc, this was the biggest engine anyone was fitting to a Super Mini. And with 84 brake horsepower on tap and 0-60 to in 9.3 seconds, made this Ford's first ever hot hatch. It may not have had the firepower to match the Renault 5 Gordini, and it may only have been around for two years, but the XR2 was cool. Immensely so, thanks to the pepper pot alloy wheels, plastic wheel arch extensions, front driving lamps, and the brilliant side graphics. Over the next few pages are the Fiesta's features, options, and specifications, and if you'd like to read any of this, then just pause the video. But I would like to bring our attention to one thing. 
And that's the fact that a gear was priced the same as an XR2. I know which one I'd have. Next up is a car very nearly as important as the Fiesta, and that's the Mark III Ford Escort. The first front drive and hatchback bodied family car they've made, and subsequently the most successful car we'll see today. The Mark III Escort was nearly always topping the sales charts, as they're making a point of, and was crowned the 1981 European Car of the Year. Starting again with the standard Escort, and you don't get very much with it. But this car came along in 1980, and 18 years later in 1998, the world celebrated the Ford Focus getting independent rear suspension. But the Mark III Escort also had an independent rear end. It was an exceptionally simple system with swing arms, coils and tie bars, but it was there nonetheless. And this was Ford's second front drive car following on from the Fiesta, and saw their real entry into the modern world, moving away from the rear drive and cart springs of the Mark II. The next two pages show the Escort L and GL, and this L is trimmed really nicely, I think. The Strato Silver paint really suits, and the Bristol Blue fabric works brilliant with it. It's just tasteful and so very average for 1982, especially as the key features are a 5-speed gearbox, a passenger door mirror, a clock, and a trip meter. No expense spared. So to the Escort gear, and apart from the chrome finishing and chrome wheel trims, which are glorious, it's all about the optional electric windows and blanks over the winder holes. These were optional on most Escorts, but gear, gear. And before we move on, let's take a second to talk engines, because although the 1100 was a Kent engine, the 1300 and 1600 were new overhead cam CVH engines that launched with the car in 1980. The Fiesta would also eventually get these when the Mark II was launched in 83, but for now, Ford were using two different four-cylinder engines that overlapped in size. And for the Escort XR3, that 1600 engine was given a twin Venturi Weber carburetor, producing 96 brake horsepower. But the real centre of attention is, again, the appearance because the twin driving lamps became something of an XR hallmark, and while the interior, just like the Fiestas, is rather restrained, the cloverleaf alloys are brilliantly unusual. Right at the back of the Escort section, though, are the estates, and I love the bread van three-door estate thing. It never made any sense for them to produce, but they did, and I kind of dig that. In fact, you couldn't get a five-door Mark III Escort estate, which is totally maddening. Again, all the features, options, and specs, and then we move on to the main attraction of the whole brochure, the new Ford Sierra. This man and machine in perfect harmony thing was the memorable Sierra advertising campaign. And again, this and the car as a whole are evidence of Ford's marketing genius. The old Mark V Cortina the Sierra replaced was a really old-fashioned car. Mechanically, it hadn't really been changed since 1970, and though the Sierra would remain rear-wheel drive, it moved on massively in terms of technology. It still wasn't particularly modern, as a lot of the rear end was carried over from the existing Granada, and its competitors, primarily the Vauxhall Cavalier and Austin Montego, were now all front drive but it did have a trailing arm independent rear end, and the front switched to McPherson struts, so it was all very easily understood and nobody was scared of it, which ensured it stayed popular with businesses. But the key to its desirability was the shape, because the Cortina was essentially a box on wheels. It had a drag coefficient of 0.45 and looked elderly. So the Sierra totally rejected that, and embarked on a stylistic mission of minimising drag, joining cars like the Audi 100 in the renaissance of aerodynamically minded design. But unlike the Audi, the Ford went out of its way in expressing its design philosophy, with Ewe Barnson's shape being so different to the Cortina, it became nicknamed the Jelly Mould. Initially, this was actually seen as an issue, 
as it did scare off a small portion of Ford's elderly clientele. But that was absolutely fine, because the future is now, and the Sierra still looked fresh 10 years on, while the rest of the competition had to be replaced way before. So let's get into the range itself, and we start with the basic Sierra, one here that is sold as a saloon, despite the fact that it was a hatchback. But that nomenclature is just proof of how narrow and how ambiguous our definitions of car design are, as the only differences between a hatchback and a saloon, in reality, at the angle of the rear screen and the size of the rear door. And of course, the elephant in the room being that the Sierra was Ford's first hatchback in this market segment. Again, nothing new, nothing controversial by 1982, but it was just a nice feature to have, and one that Ford brought in very elegantly and without much fuss. But this basic Sierra is so different in appearance to the model we saw in previous shots, because the front end is totally different, with a proper grille and even a black plastic surround. Compared to the Fiesta and Escort base models, the Sierra really shows off its poverty spec in the worst possible way. This is an ugly car, but the dashboard with all the blanks and all the cubby holes is glorious in its own way. The Sierra L and GL still have the proper front grille, but they at least have body coloured nose cones. And in this brochure, the Sierra is the only car I can relate to, as there were just a few still knocking around when I was little, but none with these pre-facelifts. And I don't even recall seeing any at car shows. So for some reason, a massively popular, rather game-changing car for Ford has somehow become exceptionally rare in its early form. But these more basic Sierras were available with a 1300 or 1600cc engine, with a 2 litre 4 pot also available on the GL, alongside the 2.3 Cologne V6. Now, you might expect these units, as their overhead cam, to be CVHs, as we saw with the Escort. But the engine madness continues, as here is a third, totally different four-cylinder engine, the Pinto, carried over directly from the Cortina, as was the V6. It probably would have made sense for the brand new Sierra to use the engines designed with the Escort from two years prior, but that would be far too sensible. And to be fair, the CVH was so rough, it probably wouldn't have done it any good. Now, eventually, CVH units would become available in the Sierra, but these three lumps, the Kent, CVH and Pinto, would all still be in European Fords into the 1990s. But without dwelling on that, the top Sierra was, of course, the gear. At this point, there was no XR4i or Cosworth Sierras. They'd come later. But at launch, we had just a posh one at the top of the range, and with it came that aerodynamic front end used in all the marketing material. Seems a bit strange to only use your new design on the top model, but I suppose the proper grille made it a little less shocking in appearance than the flush front. And with the lack of any chrome or any visual features on the gear, they probably needed something to separate it from the GL. Well apart from having three vents on the wheel trims instead of two, but 90% of people would never notice that. Next along, of course, are the Sierra Estates. And unlike the Escort, you can spec up a gear estate. But I want to address what I perceive to be a bit of a failure on Ford's part. The Fiesta and Escort were exceptionally well marketed and sold in incredible numbers, cementing Ford's top spot. But the Sierra, though selling well, didn't continue the Cortina's dominant legacy in the UK. The new appearance, coupled to old mechanicals, led to a lot of question marks, and the Vauxhall Cavalier overtook the Sierra as the UK's favourite because it was more modern, better looking, and didn't turn away consumers like the Sierra did. In the 1980s, people were nowhere near as scared of front drive as they were in the 60s, as evidenced by the Fiesta, Escort, and the Cavalier. So while the Sierra was a safe and sensible bet in retaining its company car market, it did nothing to further itself. And though it stayed fresh for a long time, its replacement was totally different. And sticking with that old-fashioned theme for a little while longer, with the good old Ford Capri. 
In this selection of Fiestas and Sierras, the Capri looks totally lost as a relic from a different era that was actively being killed by the Hot Hatch. But with no Sierra XR4i about yet, it still had its place as a big two-door six-cylinder coupe. Although it had been massively facelifted in 1978, the Mark III Capri was showing its age already, partly because of the hot hatch movement and partly because underneath it was still a 1970 Cortina with a live axle and leaf springs. But I do really quite like the Capri for its accessibility. Unlike many genuine sporting coupes, you didn't have to spend loads of money and end up with a thirsty engine, because you could get a Capri L or LS with not very much equipment and a little 1600 Pinto. But in the case of the LS, you got red detailing, jazzy seats, loads of dials and a little rear spoiler. But the Capri GL and if we skip forwards, the Capri gear are outliers in this range because they don't have an ounce of sportiness about them. They're just old cars in an impractical body with things like an automatic gearbox. It doesn't make any sense and these are part of how the Capri and Vauxhall's equivalent, the Opel Manta, managed to get a rather seedy reputation all over Europe. Derek Trotter drove a Capri gear and he kept the windows rolled up to make other drivers think he had air conditioning. But the spec does everything for one of these, because by ignoring the comfort options, we see the Capri in its best light, first with the Capri S. This one still has a four-cylinder engine, the two-litre, but you get uprated suspension, the cool seats we've already seen, but also the all-important alloy wheels and cool S graphics. So the S is kind of the get the look Capri, but the important one is the famous 2.8 injection with its full complement of cylinders in the Cologne V6 and it's the first car we've seen today with fuel injection. And unlike the S, it doesn't need jazzy graphics, just the simple red pinstripe and injection lettering and the pepper pot wheels mark its place. In hindsight, it's quite a simple looking top model but the interior's glorious with the Recaro seats and Carla trim. Of course, we have the features, options, specs and prices, and then we can move on to our final car for today, the big Ford Granada. Unlike the smaller Sierra, the Granada was that bit more conservative, and so always stayed behind in the old style for a few more years. So this car is much more similar in appearance to the old Mark V Cortina than it is the Sierra. An aero-shaped Granada would come along in 1985, but for now, this 1977 vintage Granada was the company director's transport. Both the Sierra and Granada segments are ones Ford has now left, and with the Fiesta going, there's the genuine question of whether the Focus and Mustang are going to be Ford's only proper cars in the European market. Who'd have thought, at this point in 1982, that in 40 years, the only lines in this brochure to survive would be the Escort and Capri. But back to the Focus, and in the rest of Europe, the basic Granada L was available with the 1.6 Pinto. But in the UK, for some reason, the 2 litre was the bottom of the range. And I think that's to do with the social standing of this car. Because Ford's real heartlands were in the company car market. And if you were given a Granada, you were someone. So a 1.6 litre power unit didn't really suit that image. But the engineering was conventional, and despite the fact the Sierra was modernised by borrowing its rear suspension from this car, the Mark II Granada carried its suspension directly over from the original, which was launched in 1972. Again, it's not a very modern car. The Fiesta and Escort were Ford's white heat offerings, while the Sierra, Capri and Granada all soldiered along with rather ancient technology. But that's not to say there's anything wrong with that, because these Granadas perform their role as comfortable long-distance cruisers perfectly well for thousands. The Granada GL is where things get exciting though, and not just because of the crystal green over green Sanford, which is so fabulously period correct, but because of the equipment. 
The GL comes with electric front windows, electric mirrors, heated mirrors, and most importantly, an electrically adjustable driver's seat. This is incredibly posh for 1982, but you don't get power steering as standard, which I think is yet more evidence of Ford offering you the flashy stuff over the important stuff. You had to get a gear for that. On this car, you also get an auto box and electric rear windows, along with loads of other stuff. But the one we care for is the top of the line Granada Gear X. The X standing for executive. What is strange is that you can get a 2.3 in the X, but the gear is 2.8 only. But regardless, you get air conditioning, a trip computer and heated seats. But you needed the X to get rear seat belts as standard. It's the 80s. Of course, there's a range of Granada estates as well for if you need something that can rival a transit for sheer space. And there's a diesel available. We'll get back to that, but the curious bit is up at the top, because what we haven't seen is the Gear X topping 2.8 injection Granada, and over the page is the saloon version of that Capri injection engine being placed in the big saloon. Now, this doesn't really sit at the top of the range, hence why I think they put the estates in between. But despite having less equipment, this is the sporty Granada. Well, however sporty a Granada can be. But across the page is much more curious, and they're the Granada diesels. They clearly wanted to separate these from the general range and only gave all three of these cars a single page rather than a two-page spread as the rest got. And they're selling this in a consumer non-commercial brochure as a taxi. I don't quite understand why they did this, but it's still intriguing and fascinating to see. I mean, who could turn their nose up at heavy-duty vinyl seat trim and ashtrays on all doors? Finally are all the Granada features, options and specs, as we've come to expect, but over the page are the option packs. Modern cars are spec just like this. In fact, there are very few things you can add to a modern car without adding a whole pack. But Ford were doing it back in 1982, partly because it makes it easier for everyone and because it's a lot cheaper to add a bulk of options onto the cars than add an individual selection. But with all these executive packs, there's one I want to address. The Granada Handling Pack. The Granada, mainly due to its size, wasn't the sharpest of cars to pedal about, and it's telling that they felt the need to offer this as an option. But you get alloy wheels, fat tyres, and much stiffer suspension. Next is Ford's extra cover warranty plan. But what we care about are the accessories, like a CB radio, air horns, a remote boot release, and all the tasteless stuff like exhaust trims, wheel arch protectors, and seat covers. It's like a Ford endorsed branch of Halfords. I love it. So there we have it, a rather comprehensive look at what Fords were like 40 years ago. It's a long time when we consider what's going on now, and on that note, thank you very much for watching. If you enjoyed the video, then please do click like and subscribe to Twincam as well. I'm forever indebted to my wonderful Patreon supporters, so if you'd like to support me that way, then please follow the link in the description. And I'll have more videos coming along soon.